real quick. Hi, it's Claudia with Real Progressives. We're laughing, but um, I'm actually here with uh, Steve Grumbein and Tim Canova, and they have been talking economics, and I was thinking it's just perfect to put them on the spot right here. <laughs> Say hi. Hey there. Hey there. And of course, Steve, you all know. Hello, party people. Hello. So they were just talking about what? DC, how to afford... I, I don't get it. You, just, you need to start over. <laughs> Now we're to start. So we're, we've been talking about the fundamental uh, issues regarding the economy in the United States as we speak. Um, and really, we've gone all the way back to Roosevelt, and we've worked our way up through Kennedy and uh, talked a little <laughs> bit about Reagan. And I think we're starting to get to the crash um, and discussing some of the differences in approach and looking at deficits and debt. Um, you know, as we've talked about foreign, foreign uh, countries owning U.S. debt and the difference between debt denominated in our own currency versus debt that we owe to an external source like China and, and so forth. So I think that uh, Tim and I largely believe a lot of the same things. Um, Tim is looking at it slightly differently. I'll let him explain that. But uh, well, I'm, I'm trying not to speak in academic terms mm -hmm. after 20 years of academic uh, debates. <laughs> Bang your head against uh, the wall. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm tired of it and um, mostly trying to analyze things or, or, or discuss things from more of a historical perspective and a policy perspective. Uh, and folks realize, I think, that this country is upside down, that policy has been favoring the very elite interests in society and ignoring working folks and, and middle income folks. So how do you rebalance that? And of course it's a matter, it's a mixture of monetary policy and fiscal policy to put people back to work. Um, so that's the level that I've been trying to talk about it. And you know, we have spoken about how do you pay for it? And that's gotten us into some of these esoteric academic discussions. Anyway. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, obviously folks, you know, from my standpoint as Steve Grumbine, you know that my mind, my, my line is taxes don't fund spending, right? So they don't, but yet at the same time, there is a discussion that we're having regarding, you know, what the actual logical use of the term taxation is and, and why we do tax and and how we can get to the point where we can actually make some progress versus academic discussions about taxes and spending and so forth. So I'm coming at it from a slightly different angle in that you know, my goal is to make regular people care about economics again. And so many people have seen it as unattainable, that it is pie in the sky. Remember, going back, Paul Krugman, Hillary, the gang, calling Bernie's plans pie in the sky. And so, so much of where I'm coming from is just based on smacking the taste out of the neoliberals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and the criticism of Bernie's program was, well, how's he going to pay for it? And your, your attitude is, your answer is, what, that you don't have to pay for it in a way. We don't. We're, we're a monetarily sovereign nation. As long as we're dealing in debt denominated in our own currency... We but what about, what about debt denominated in our currency that's held by foreigners? Well, a trillion dollars by China, a trillion dollars by Japan, and maybe close to a trillion dollars by the Saudis. Now, you know I would say it's a keystroke entry at the Fed, just <laughs> vanoosh, you know. And, 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 but in the popular imagination, if not the academic world, there's this idea that the Chinese, the Japanese, the Saudis could just start selling their holdings of treasuries and isn't that going to be a disaster for the American economy as the dollar collapses? I would say, I would say no, because what would, would happen is we would end up bringing industry back to the United States. We would so end the, up the lower dollar, the lower value of the dollar would help uh, American industry. Yes, and it would bring those jobs back if that's what we wanted to do. I'm of the but, mindset. But what if the, what if the, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. What, what if the declining value of the dollar is coinciding with a meltdown in our securities markets? As foreigners are selling their dollar holdings, you got the stock market declining and bond markets that are declining, yields are going up. That can't be good for the domestic economy. I think as long as we take our dollar and we have to tax it. I really believe that if you want to give up your dollar, for example, that I'll take it. 
I think that really what comes down to is that we would have a shift in the United States economy for sure. We would immediately see our dollar wouldn't be buying. And the reason why we're able to be a net importer right now is because our dollar is good outside the United States. That would immediately shift. We would end up not being able to buy things the way we've been. It would raise the cost of goods outside the United States and would thus make United States domestic products in demand, which would then in turn bring industry back here, which I think would maybe for the short term see a really sharp spike in productivity in the United States, raise GDP, and then in turn we would become a net exporter at that point in time. I think it's just a shift that would end up flipping the switch. We would end up going the other direction. I could be wrong, but that's the way I've seen. And, and I, I'll say on the campaign trail, politically, you know, folks would try to raise this as an argument against this kind of a program that Americans are going to want to spend more on their clothing, on their iPhones, on their consumer products. Uh, so wouldn't this kind of a domestic program to, you know, reindustrialize, to bring manufacturing back to the United States be terrible for the American consumer? This is what I would be asked a lot on the campaign trail. I said, well, when you look at the rest of the program, as far as federal subsidies for education, single payer, uh, federal subsidies for housing, perhaps, uh, public housing, these are the big costs that consumers are facing all the time, the cost of education, health care, and housing. You could be bringing down those costs dramatically and it would far outweigh whatever increase there is in the cost of an iPhone or, 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 or clothing or something. Like Absolutely. That. I mean, in, if we finance as a government the needs of the people so that we're not capitalizing on human need mm -hmm. and we start making the capitalism in our country based on wants as opposed to those needs, mm -hmm. I think that the kinds of shocks to the economy you're talking about would not be nearly as sharp if we were able to redirect that to just want-based mm -hmm. economy. I, you, a lot of what we're used to in this country, I think, we, we've grown so accustomed to consumerism that I think that it would inherently cause a shock. But by having more people employed in the United States, because all of a sudden now we have jobs. Now all of a sudden, all those jobs, those blue-collar jobs that went away. Now I'm not advocating for this, by the way, but all those blue-collar jobs that come back a lot of people would suddenly have those jobs again. And I think that once all those rising tides, these people have jobs again, I think that you see a different kind of an upsurge in the economy. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but that's the way I see it. Okay. So, bad deal? Good no, deal. A, a new deal. Uh, so <laughs> so let, let me ask you this. Uh, tell me a little bit about tomorrow's uh, rally, the real progressives uh, rally that we're going to have this March to take back democracy. Well, you're gonna have a lot of people there, uh, yourself included, Claudia. Um, and I think the goal here for uh, this march is to let Washington know that progressives in general are in the house, that we are not going away, that just because they found a way to rig this election, um, because they found a way to um, take away our voice, now that we've seen what's come from WikiLeaks, Mm -hmm. And we've seen uh, the treatment that Julian Assange has received. Um, we're here to tell them that we know what you did last summer, and we're not going to take it anymore. And um, you know, I think that that's kind of the mantra here. You're going to have some burners. Mm -hmm. You're going to have some indies. You're going to have some greens. Ultimately, you're going to have people seeking progress. And uh, I think that's what you're going to see tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'm looking forward to it. What are you going to talk about? Well, you know... Let's wait until tomorrow. Uh, I, 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 I don't. I don't want to give away the story. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Good right. answer. All right, that was interesting. We have two really great, great, amazing people here, and um, we will see you all tomorrow. This is Claudia with Real Progressives, and of course, Cabin Talk. I can't leave that out, Steve. You're fine. <laughs> and so we'll see you all tomorrow, either on the mall in person, or we will see you. Um, on here on a live stream and we will be doing live streams throughout the day on all kinds of sites but F definitely on Real Progressives everything is happening tomorrow so yay we'll see you then bye bye